Not many people do 25 years in the same job, let alone at the same radio station. But for the man who's with me now, it has certainly been a marathon, not a sprint, first cliche of the day, because that's uh, what Adrian Durham has done at TalkSport. 25 years of unstinting service to the same station. Not always on the same programme, of course. We're just going to delve into those 25 years uh, for the next few minutes. So, Adrian, 25 years. Wow, that's an amazing achievement. Do you remember the first day at TalkSport? I do. Uh, TalkSport was talk radio then. TalkSport started in January mm -hmm. 2000. My first day was April the 30th, 1999. So I kind of, I've been here longer than TalkSport, which feels really weird. But um, walked into the building, which was on Oxford Street at the time, middle of London. And uh, I was there solely to check out the computers because the next day I was doing sports bulletins. So I'm checking out the computers and all of a sudden we heard this noise and the, the programme director came rushing up, said, right, who's got a mobile phone? 1999, not everybody had one then. Nobody had one. He gave me his mobile phone, didn't know who I was because I was there to check out the computers, said, run down there and report live from the scene. Now that a bomb had gone off, the Admiral Duncan bomb had gone off the nail bomb in 1999 and luckily for the, the program director I had a lot of news background so I ran down there reported live into the six o'clock bulletin and that was the first time I was on what became talk sport so that was I see that as my first day that was April the 30th an incredible story to be thrown into it was harrowing the scenes at the time um, and little did I know that the career that I would have 25 years on um, would not be news based, it would be sports based, but it was quite the introduction, I have to mm. say. So, had your ambitions been, you know, to take the news pathway, or had you always dreamt, I mean, you were a big sports fan, you always dreamt of being a sports reporter, sports presenter? Yeah, I'd, I'd been a, a football fan a long time since I can remember, went to my first game age six, but I'd also been a radio fan, it was, it was a big thing for me, radio, and I had a little uh, portable transistor radio when I was little, still got it to this day, it doesn't quite work still, but it was, it was a wonderful thing. I'd say it was my best friend when I was a little boy, and, and radio became that because there were so many different voices on it. So I listened to lots of different radio programs, music, news, sport, um, but I always thought uh, I wouldn't be able to get into sport because there wasn't that much around. Talk sport didn't exist at the time. So I thought that's going to be too difficult. So I thought about news. I was into politics massively and, and I wanted to be a Westminster reporter, first of all. Did a load of news, interviewed Tony Blair when he was Prime Minister, did murder cases, court cases, some really big stuff as well in news. And then decided when Princess Diana died, I kind of became disillusioned with news and decided to come away from news, ended up doing more and more sports and ended up at Talk Sports. So, I think ultimately my path would always have taken me to sports because that was really, football really was my first love. Mm. Um, and obviously, I happen to remember you presenting Drive for many, many years. What, 15, 16 years, something like that? 15 years. I'd been doing the evening show, 7 till 10, mm. uh, from 2000 through till 2006. And then they decided to give me a go on Drive, so I was doing it with somebody you know well, Rodney Marsh. Yeah. And I were doing Drive uh, together. Uh, that lasted a few months. They tried a few people. Ian Wright came in. Um, Mickey Quinn did it for a while as well. All good fun. These are great people. Then Goffey arrived and he did 12 years on the show, which uh, I think is staggeringly brilliant. And kudos to him for doing that. He, he was really good. How did you regard being effectively, if I can put it this way, being a, a sort of shock jock? <laughs> you, you know, with things like the Daily Arsenal, mm. you know. I mean, for instance, of social media, you must have got such a battery. I did, and I made a huge mistake on social media. I wasn't interested, and still not really massively interested in social media, not, not on a broader level. My Instagram now is private, you know, so yeah. I, you know, I'm quite a private individual generally. But they said to me, you need to have a Twitter account. So I said, I'll take on the Drive account, and then when, when you get rid of me on Drive, I'll just give it back, because I don't really want to do Twitter. Well, it just went through the <laughs> roof. It, it, was, it was the biggest account they had. And it was just because sometimes I would just go on there and put an opinion about a football match. And we all have opinions yep. on a football match, don't we? But it would just be an opinion on, say, I don't think that Man United goal should have stood. You're bombarded with, wow, you hate Manchester United. Why do you hate? You know exactly what I'm talking <laughs> about. So that went through the roof. But 
The thing is, I, I've never really understood the criticism, really. And you're right, it was shock jock stuff, absolutely. And you're meant to have opinions, and some of mine were seen as outlandish, and I get that as well. But, you know, I, I certainly didn't want to be boring, but we all have opinions on football. And it puzzled me that people were thinking, um, you're so opinionated. Well, so are you. If you think about any football match that you watch or any football story, literally every football fan will have opinions on that story. So I didn't see what I was doing as any different to anybody else who was listening, really. And guess what? They used to ring in and have their opinions yeah. as well. No, look, it, it worked because many a time when I was listening to it, I thought I was so wound up by <laughs> it that I thought I'm going to ring, you know, <laughs> which of course is, is exactly what you want. So, of course, somebody did ring. One Jamie Carragher. <laughs> you tell us about that. Yeah, that was the. F I think it was a major breakthrough actually. Although, you know, Talksport had been going seven years when that call happened. Mm. So he retired from England duty in 2007. I was incensed by it because I'm a passionate England fan, genuinely an England fan. Um, and I genuinely was angry about it because, first of all, I thought he was a really good player. Mm -hmm. and I, I thought England could use him. But secondly, it really felt like somebody turning their back on the country. And I couldn't, as a fan, you can't understand that. So I was doing the show with Mickey Quinn, who thankfully had had um, some, spent some time with Jamie beforehand. But at the end of like, so we started at four, I've gone full on, he's a bottler. He's bottled, you know, the challenge of playing for England again. It's a disgrace, blah, blah, blah. And at quarter past, he's rung in. So Mickey gets called into the control room and, and takes the call, speaks to Jamie. First thing Mickey said to him was, you're not allowed to swear that much if you're going to come on air, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he uh, toned that down a little bit, Jamie. But he came on and he gave as good as I'd given him, absolutely. In the end, we agreed to disagree, but it was very heated. He, in the call, invited me to Liverpool to say it to his face. And Quinny and I actually went up and did a show from, he used to have a bar in Liverpool, we did the show from the bar. Uh, he walked in and he threw a bag at me, um, a shopping bag. <laughs> and in it was a, a signed shirt that he'd worn at the World Cup in oh, 2006. Brilliant. I know, it was, thankfully, I thought I'd better take him a gift. I took for him <laughs> a framed photo of him lying on the Wembley turf, having been left for dead by Ronaldinho in a friendly with Brazil. So I'm not quite sure that picture went down quite as well, but <laughs> they, it, was, it was meant as humorous. He took it in that way as well. And it was a great night that we had there. It was fantastic. And we've been in touch ever since. He's done shows with me since yeah. then as well. So, but that was a, it was a big call for the station, I think, because I think that that gave us that credibility that people then knew I and mean, we all knew anyway, but people then knew that, yes, the top footballers are listening to this. They care about what's being said on it. And I think the idea of somebody calling in to give their side of it was exactly what we were looking for. You know, it's not us lecturing people. It's us giving our opinions. You're allowed to either put us right or have your opinion. And that's what Jamie did that mm -hmm. day. And, and others followed suit, Steve Bruce, David Moyes. There's been several who have who've rung in to correct, in their minds, correct things that have been said on air. Yeah, well, what, was your, what was your mentality like when you heard, for instance, that someone like David Boyes was ringing in? Were you, were you quaking in your boots? You don't strike <laughs> me as the sort who does quake in their boots. I did with a Carragher call, actually, yeah. because it was so unexpected, because it hadn't happened up to that point. And I was thinking, Mickey Quinn always says that when he saw my face, when he told me Carragher's coming on, that my face fell and I was like, oh my God. I think I was more, right, what am I going to say here? It was, it was, there was a nervousness about, yeah, let's make this really good radio rather than I'm scared of him. What can he do to me down a phone line? You know, <laughs> there's nothing that's going to happen there. So, um, yeah, I was shocked and there was a little bit of panic maybe, right, let's get this right. But I remember when Moyes called in, it was actually to, I'd given his side of the story and he was saying, you're right, you've given the side of the story. So that was fine. Steve Bruce calling in was a... He was very upset with something, not that I'd said, but that we'd put out there as a station. It just so happened mm. he called our show to, to put that right. So I, I actually thrived on those, those calls, really. Rather than being fearful or anything like that, I, I thrived on those because that meant we were, not that we'd provoke them, but it meant that they cared about what we were saying, which meant that TalkSport was working and doing mm. well. There must have been so many memorable moments over those years. But I, I, I wonder, how did you feel you know, when your career changed path and you became more involved in live stuff, you know, and 
became the, the voice of talk sports live football coverage. Elated. That's where mm. I always wanted to be. So the Saturday show I've been doing since September 1999. Yeah. So that's been going on for pretty much the full 25 years. So that show, and it, and it was previously in a studio. It was only around 2010 that they started sending me out every Saturday. And I loved it and still love it to this day, Jeff. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, I, I love reporting from football games. It's what I always did in, in my early years my, as a cub reporter. M my wife said to me, you come home on a Saturday and you're fully enthused. And she said, in the weekdays, sometimes you come home and you're not quite right. And I said, well, it's probably because I'm thinking about the next day's show and I'm like, what are we going to mm -hmm. do? We've got to make it as good as this show. So it was a real pressure daily to do that. And I, I enjoyed that in a certain way, but she, she described it as me being frustrated. So I thought to myself, well, how can I have Saturdays every day of the week? It's just not possible. But what I could do is have them Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So there was a discussion with management at the time, and they were all for it. So the new role that I've been doing for now for a couple of years totally appealed to me, and, and I love it. This feels like the job that I really wanted to do in the first place. Yeah. So obviously you immerse yourself in it and we get your passion for football, your desire to be there. But the thing that really impresses me, and I was listening at the weekend for instance, um, is that encyclopedic knowledge that you have. How much work goes into it? I mean, I've got an idea, <laughs> yeah. but you tell me how much work goes say, into I it. I think you know exactly how much work mm. goes into it. Basically, all day Friday is spent mm. um, finding out the basics, like what kind of run a team is on, who's got the goals and what run they're on, all of that stuff. And at the, at the latter stage of the season, what they need to do to stay up or go up or whatever. All of that is, is basic stuff that needs doing on a Friday. But also I love little nuggets of information, golden nuggets. And you only kind of find those out by going down that rabbit warren of, of information, you know, just, just finding things out and, and eventually it could take you 45 minutes on one particular club to work something mm -hmm. out, but I just love finding that out. And a great example this season was, um, so Oxford City have been in the National League this season. They've been relegated, finished bottom, but uh, one of their players, Josh Parker, key man for them, he's been their best player. Um, I thought, I don't really know this guy, so I did a bit of research on him. He's played for Stal Bucharest. He's been on Come Dine <laughs> with me, played in Aberdeen, I'm like, this guy's career, some of the interviews he's done. So you give that a little mention and somebody somewhere is like, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. If you can, if I find one nugget of information and it makes somebody somewhere say, wow, that's fantastic, that's amazing, didn't know that, then that's job done for me. And one of the things I loved about listening as well is the fact that, um, okay, you, you've got to have a plan. I, I, I get you've got to have a plan. But one of the biggest frustrations I find in broadcasting sometimes is it, it's pretty darned apparent when somebody has pre-scripted something and is effectively just reading that script. You, you sound so natural on this. Yeah, I, I, you can't script it. No, of course you can't. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the point, isn't it? I think, and sometimes, you know, you, you have to rip things up if they are scripted mm. and just go, go with your own way anyway. Even in studio shows, you know this. But I think that that's the essence of it. Saturday afternoons from three o'clock, Traditionally, you go along to a game because you just don't know what's going to happen. Your team could be bottom of the table and you don't know what's going to happen. And it's that you can't predict it, you can't guarantee it, and you can't rely on it, certainly. You can't rely on your football club for happiness. That's absolutely true. <laughs> you got a favourite a favorite match that you've been at and hosted Ooh. from? Um, I, I'd have to say the, uh, the last World Cup final was extraordinary. Um, the Argentina-France mm. one. And I can remember after we'd come off air, I was in shock, really, at, at, at what, was, what had just happened, football-wise. And the fact, I think it was, the, it was the second World Cup final I'd done, but the first I'd felt I'd authentically done for various reasons. Um, I wasn't really meant to do the first one in 06, but I, you know, I, and I was very fortunate to get that, get that gig. But the one in Qatar, was, it was a very special moment, and it kind of... Uh, I've got a lovely photo from that that the producer took in, so the back of my head, the back of Stuart Pearce's head and the commentator, Jim Proudfoot, back of his head, looking out over Lusail Stadium, which was a, quite a spectacular stadium, and I'm very kind of proud of that photo. So I'd say mm. that, was the, that is the one that comes to mind, but there's, down the years there's been 
loads of moments. Um, so a playoff final win for Peterborough, presenting that one, at, it was at Old Trafford in 2011. The recent EFL trophy win, I presented that as well. That's, those moments with my club are, are very special too. There was another one where, um, a couple of seasons ago, there was a big fuss about the, the football results. I don't know if you remember this, the yeah, classified yeah. check. Okay, were so being dropped, weren't they, by a, the BBC? A certain other station dropped yep. doing the full classified check, and of course we were like, yep, we're <laughs> going to absolutely do that. So I don't know if many people realise, but on a Saturday afternoon, up to that point, I was the one who was presenting the show, so going round the grounds for full times, but I was also collating all the football results. There was no, nobody next to me doing it, nobody in the studio doing it. I was the one writing them all down. I type out my fixture lists mm -hmm. every week. Um, so people just don't believe I do it. I mean, you've got somebody to do that for you. Well, it's my job, it's what I do. So I'm getting the football results together, but when we started doing the classified check, you realise, oh, there's a whole load of new stuff that we, we're going to be doing here. So we added to what we had before, National League North and South, which I'd been wanting to do for some time, yep. to be honest. Um, the Cymru Premier in Wales, Irish Premiership as well. So there are lots of different new ones that we were putting in there. Plus, you know, if there's a Women's Super League game or even a Women's Championship game, we put those in as well. So there are a whole load more results. So I'm at Arsenal that day. The Wi-Fi goes down. It was horrendous. I'm going round the grounds thinking, I'm in a bit of trouble here. This is, and they'd advertised it widespread. So a lot of people were think, maybe tuned in thinking, are TalkSport going to get this right? This is a big test for them. Eventually managed to get all the results together, uh, started reading them, and they actually, probably for the first and only time ever, uh, my colleague Andy Jacobs messaged me afterwards saying it was flawless, and I'll take yeah. his word for it. Uh, they put it out on a tweet as well. It was one of the most deeply satisfying mm. moments. Because um, if you mess that up, there's no going back. No. You know, you've got to get that right. Well, well that's, that's the key to a great piece of broadcasting when people don't realise what is going on behind the scenes or what you are having to cope with. And it's fantastic service, by the way, as well, because obviously I'm a fan of a, a National League side as it is now. So I, I know a lot of non-league supporters. So to have things like the National League North, National League South, League of Wales, Brilliant, brilliant service. But you mentioned uh, before about Qatar, and it, it's every schoolboy's dream, isn't it? You know, you're going to international tournaments and being paid for it. Wow. It's crazy. It, 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 sometimes it makes no sense to me. Um, my wife sometimes says to me, what would five-year-old you have thought of this? And she's absolutely spot on. He wouldn't have been able to believe it. It is the dream. And it really is as good as I thought it would be. After the first tournament I did, which was, uh, we did one in 2000, which was uh, a bit weird, the uh, Euros in Holland and Belgium, but we didn't have the rights for those. This is how TalkSport right. has evolved, um, which we could get into if you, if you want, but 2006 was the first official one we did. And I did that one and thought, right, okay, I, if I don't get another tournament, I've done one. So I've ticked that off and I can be satisfied with that. And then you go to 2010 and 12 and 14 and 16 and 18 and the Euros here and then World Cup 2022, we're going to Germany this summer as well. And I'm living the dream, but I'll never take it for granted because it's just such a joy doing the whole thing. It really is still. So how did he cover Holland and Belgium then? Right, well, we, were, <laughs> we didn't have the rights, but we wanted to challenge that. The BBC had a monopoly on the rights. So we thought, well, yeah, we'll do this tournament. We applied to get the rights, but you couldn't even apply to get them. That's how much of a closed shop it was. It really, it wasn't fair, basically. So we set about challenging that as a company, um, but couldn't do it in time for 2000. So what we did was we stayed, <laughs> they said to me uh, in May, just before the tournament started, are you okay staying in a hotel in Amsterdam for a month? Yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> so we basically had to do them uh, the best way we could, which was from a hotel room in Amsterdam, off the TV, but the crowd effects were done at studios in London. And B the BBC didn't like that, obviously, so they challenged it and we had to say on air, this is not the BBC. We had to say the sound effects come from a studio in London. They made us say all that. There was a lawyer in the room with us at the time as well. He never bought a round, by the way. <laughs> um, so we, did, we had a great time, but that was the first step and challenging the monopoly. Yeah. And by 2006, we challenged it successfully, and now we are fully official rights holders. It, yeah. A major breakthrough, I think, in British broadcasting. Yeah. And now, let's be brutally honest about it, front runners, 
in, in sports broadcasting. You mentioned some names there, the Frank Stebblins, Alvin Martins, and before Stuart Pearce. Um, I, I know from my experience, you know, mixing with the Phil Thompsons and Charlie Nicholas's and, um, and the such like of this world, you've got to pinch yourself sometimes, haven't you? To think, not only am I working with these people, but these are international footballers who I can call my mates. That's so true. And I think the, the first time that really sunk in, I knew that was happening all the time, but the first time that really sunk in was uh, when Ian Wright came to work on Drive. Um, and I hadn't really grasped, because you're in the industry, you don't really grasp how huge somebody is. And uh, we were doing a, an outside broadcast in Liverpool in the afternoon, and he, he said he'd come and pick me up. So he drove down my street, and he's like, it's a quiet street in Hertfordshire. And he's honking his horn. Hey, <laughs> where are you? And uh, people are looking out of windows. I said, hey, I'm right. Yes, it is, I'm right. I get in the car, drive. So off we go. And then we uh, stopped at a service station. And uh, <laughs> we're in the, uh, the toilets of this service station. And um, a guy recognises Ian while we're standing there. And uh, says, you Ian Wright? And he says, never mind about that. Aid can't go. Look at him. And it's like, please. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that was the kind of guy he was. I mean, obviously, so many, so many things have changed. Are, are there any standout things that have changed? I think when we moved premises to the news building, um, that raised the level of professionalism to a point where it had never been before. And I think it, everybody was thinking, oh, OK. Because the old place, the, the kitchen was terrible. You know, there were rats scurrying around. It was, it was dreadful. Studios were falling apart. And I think people, you know, if you're not working in a professional environment, then that can affect you whether you want it to or not. And I think that it, it was affecting some people. Moving to this building has been a huge thing for the station. And I think when, I think when certain people arrived at the station, so. There's been a drip effect with that. So Ian Wright come in, I think it was 2007, I think it was. Um, him arriving, suddenly everybody's up their game. Well, it's Ian Wright. Um, I'd say the same with you, Jeff, to be honest with you. That, you know, when you arrived on breakfast, everybody was like, whoa, OK. This, this, is, this guy is an absolute broadcasting legend. He's arrived on... And then they heard me. <laughs> <laughs> They're just talking about West Ham, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, when, I think when people arrive or when guests come in, I mean, say like Gareth Southgate came in the yeah. first day we were in this building, you know, and he's, and he's, we're taking him on a tour and he's, he's giving us some insight, and, you know, just things like that, that when you realise this is a, this radio station is a major player in sport and football in this country. And for me personally, when I go back to the early days, you know, we weren't even allowed in, in football grounds officially to get from there to where we are now there's been lots of stepping stones along the way and it's involved people and and buildings but also decisions that have been made as well the amount of professionalism that's come in as i think has have been a huge thing for talk sport mm. and well no one's more no one is more professional than you adrian that that is for sure so 25 years in what does the next 25 years look like for you <laughs> ah, it's a great question um I, I think i would happily keep doing this that i'm doing now out to a game on a Saturday, out to a game on a Tuesday and a Wednesday. I, you know, that's, that's taken me to a very big age. <laughs> yeah, aid is living the dream. It is though, and uh, you know, it's something that you don't really want to give up. So who knows where the station's going? You know, I, I, I always used to say, for 25 years I've been saying, you know, they could turn themselves into a country and Western music station tomorrow and, and I'll, I'll say I've had a great ride. Fantastic, thank you very much, and on we go. But you'd be gutted <laughs> at yeah. the same time. I'll just carry on doing, oh, this is how my philosophy is, Jeff. I'll just carry on doing what I'm doing and somebody somewhere at some point will say, I think we've had enough of you. And I'll just say, well, thanks for the ride. It's been an absolute blast. I think that's some time in the distance, Adrian. Hope so. Well done on so far. Cheers, pal. Fantastic. Inspiration.